Welcome everyone. Today on the podcast, we have with us Ankush Agarwal sir. Ankush Agarwal sir is founder of Search Capital, uh, and he and he uh, also uh, writes a blog called Diary of a Private Investor. Many of you might have uh, read sir's blogs. Uh, welcome on the podcast, sir. Hi, Jay. Thank you for having me. It's great. Yeah, I'm audible. Did you know? Yeah, 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 audible, sir. Yeah, now, now we all can correction is clear. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. The first question to you is, sir, what inspired you to become a CA, and how was your journey in stock market started? And how is it being like? So CA, you know, as such, uh, it wasn't something planned. But you know, when I was, you know, into college, so that time there was this way of just picking up that time. Hmm. And you know, so that time it wasn't planned. But CA as a profession looked something that you know had some value at that time at least. Other than doing CA, CS, or few other courses, so okay. it was just that you know, coming from a business family, you had this thing that you want to do business or something. So you thought you know CA as a course would be good. So I just took it. So it wasn't planned or something or like I was interested, in, but I took it because obviously it looked good. Like a lot of cousins in my family itself are CA, so I'll probably would be fourth or fifth CA in my cousins. It's just my generation. Wow. So. So that wave picked up, and I also eventually took C and did it. When was this year, sir? So it, it is 2013, 14, 13. I entered. So 13, I think I gave CPT, which is a entrance course. And 2017 is when I became the C. Wow. Yeah, 2017 I became C. Wow, fantastic! And then the, the did you get interested in stock markets uh, during C or after that? Yeah, yeah. So. Like anyone who would have done CA knows that whenever you get into articles, which is when you have to work under a CA just before finals for three years. So at that time, at some moment, you get into stocks because uh, during that article ship period, some senior or the other guy would be into somehow. So when you are obviously you also get influence. So I remember back during my article ship days, you know, some of the seniors were talking about stocks and they they were talking about Rakesh Jhun and all of that time. Yeah. Till that time, I didn't even know Rakesh Jhun all over, honestly. So this is, uh, I think, 2015. So I just looked up uh, who this guy is, and I got his uh, Wizards of Dalal Street uh, video, blog. the old one. Oh, okay, okay, video. You have a Wizards of Dalal Street, which is a new one, a uh, fresh breeze. Uh, there was an old one, uh, the original Ramit Damani one. Yeah. So he was there. So a lot of people got inspired. Even I also got inspired by hearing. It. Like, and I could read a lot of things. He was also a CA. He also started that time. So you know, one could get inspired seeing that you know this guy started with nothing and has become so big. So eventually, I also started that way. Also, you know, watching him and you know, like everyone starts. You know, everyone in the beginning feel that you know they can also do stock. It's so easy because you know, stock is one of those professions. You know. Where it's very easy to start. Like, there's no barrier. You are smart. That day, money out of. So that's how everyone starts, and when I also started that way only. Fantastic. And the after CA, what, what all places you worked at, and how, how what all things did you learn from there? So what happened was. Uh, Since 2015, I started into stocks, so the entire mind went into stocks only. So CA was just as an education that I was doing, but yeah. the entire mind went into stocks only. So <laughs> most part I was doing trading only. So like everyone, I also started with trading. Most people starts with trading. Right? <laughs> so I started with trading, did it for a couple of years, but in that two years, I realized that you know if I have to become big in the markets, investing is the way to go. Like mm. trading, you know, you get burned out. To be honest, like every day, keep doing it. You realize that you know, even if you're successful doing it, right? There's no possibility that you can do it for next ten years also. Mm. So it's so 
you know day to day emotions that you have to see day to day ups and downs you get frustrated so okay. this so two years i did trading and then this time i realized that you know investing is the way to go okay. and by that time i had completed my ca also 2017 so okay. i realized that you know now i have to get into investing so the problem with investing was you have to read so it requires a lot of patience so you know in trade you can get 10 stock ideas you can buy and see the results but investing just to make 20 25% you have to read probably 4 500 pages to get an idea mm. right so and i used to think that you know i am a ce i can read annual reports it will be easy mm. but i remember you know taking up an annual report reading it and i thought to myself you know i don't know what to do <laughs> so since i have completed my ce i thought to myself you know if i have to learn fundamentals uh, i have to work some place because by doing it on well to get a sense of it like how to do it so just after completing my ca uh, i took up a role at money life right money life advisory services so which is run by devashish sir yeah so there i joined as an analyst and this is 2018 start uh-huh. yeah. so i remember that time also you know just a week before start you know uh devachi sir gave me and just read it uh, just start reading it before you when you join i remember the first day i picked up the annual report mm-hmm. i like i'll read and understand things and i'll do it but when i started reading it i realized that you know it is not that easy <laughs> so so the benefit of taking up a role as an analyst was that you know that your entire job was doing that mm-hmm. like, that reading reading, reading. so Yeah. Over time, you become habitual because that's your day-to-day job. If I would have to do it my on my own, it would have become very difficult to do. It. But since it my was it was my job to do it, right. it becomes easier because that is what you're doing, and then you're okay. also getting paid to do it. Right. Okay. And so that's how I started into the fundamentals thing. So I was there for about one one. and a half years at money life i used to investing and all that stuff working as an analyst to get to know a lot of people right who are the bigger players in the market who are writing good blogs like that time i remember like devashi sir uh, knew everyone like he knows everyone so i remember he, he told me about dr vijay malik uh-huh. i visited his blog he has a lot of content on you know how to research so from there i started so i read all whatever is there on his blog i read a lot of super innovation blog and whatever i could come around because since i was working as an i knew that who is this guy who is that guy and then you start reading so and then you obviously you are reading annual reports and all that company stuff as a part of your initial framework of what to do what to not do came from there like at least on the fundamentals one. and you know one thing i have learned in my life also was how to write like so i used to also write articles for the uh, magazine that they had on stocks wow. so the habit of writing and what to write how to write you know which is currently helping in it learn there because i was doing that over there so post money life 2019 yeah 2019 i joined stalin as well. uh-huh. so stalin again i joined as an analyst uh, but there increasingly i got a lot still till money life i was largely doing and at stalin uh, increasingly i got a lot of opportunity to uh, responsibility of the their research so there you know writing research reports giving stock calls getting ideas for the portfolio so with increasing responsibility since the work got increased for that one obviously the capability and understanding of doing all those stuff also increased right so initially at my life maybe i would have, i would have would be reading some about something for the sake of writing an article right but here i was doing research for the sake of recommending so those are two very different things to do right, right? doing market commentary is one thing giving out a stock recommendation is another thing and then you know writing reports giving updates a lot of things that i didn't used to do at my life like attending con calls and all that stuff because there you are not necessarily covering that stock for a long here since 
you are recommending something you have to cover that so you know attending con calls and all those additionally so and since you're recommending and you keep learning like your know, colleagues and people you're working with so that is broadly how i learned right investing in you know after reading all companies and all that so obviously you get a hang of what to do what not to do and you keep defining that so that is broadly how you know things panned out and then you increasingly keep improvising that you know, what you learn and what you do fantastic friends are fantastic so since money life you were writing articles so then you picked up the writing skills right or to curate your thoughts and mention it in a great yeah way. yeah it started there because before that you know oh, i never used to write anything right at least for a public at last right from there i started picking up that so it started in money life and then you know at money life it was like a blog like an article like yeah. what i used to wrote for diary for private investor for example at stallion i used to write research report so yeah. the research report is a different like the writing format has to be a little different so that writing aspect i learned at stallion for or writing research reports for their clients so that is helping now through with the search because search is not a blog but it's a recommendation service so that research report part has to be different correct fantastic fantastic and after 2019 when did you start diary of a private investor So 2019, I joined Stallion. Uh-huh. So I was there till March 21. Yeah, oh, okay. March 21. I was there for about one and a half years. Yeah. Right. So after I left Stallion, uh, like I was doing my own investing. Mm-hmm. But in a month or so, I realized that you know it has become very monotonous because you know researching, finding stock ideas for yourself, and investing is it's very you know limited activity. Right. Mm. You lose touch of world and all that. Stuff because you're working in isolation, right? Correct. So then I thought to myself that you know I should write a start writing something which will you know keep me engaged. So I think in April twenty one, just a month after that, I started writing as a private investor. Like a couple of blogs I started writing, and it got a good response. Right? So then it continued. So like I did it for six eight months. Then I realized that you know. in the end one has to play bigger games right so if you're investing on your own that's one thing right but if you're researching an idea and you know you know telling it to 100 people and they buy that and you become right that's a different level of cake right so i mean a lot of people questions why so many big investors they continue to invest even after having billions but the thing is you know deep down anyone who is investing full time would realize that more than money it's it's a kick of being right right If you buy something and you're proven right, that that's a bigger game than Got getting it. the money. Money is just a part of it. Yeah. Right. So even I remember, you know, Stalin when I joined, uh, there was this time when you know the first time I was given an opportunity to give a call that you know to call to investors to buy this or buy that. So I remember we had uh, an offer. That time it was some four percent weight, and I had this opportunity. I gave a call to increase weight to six percent or two percent. So the moment I sent that call in email and SMS, uh-huh. you know the satisfaction I that got was immense. Wow. Like, you know this is the decision that I have made, and this is now I've communicated to people, and they're gonna buy. It. Mm. You know, then and there I realized that you know, in the end, doing your own investing is one thing, but when you do it at large, that's a bigger game. So like I was doing writing the blog that time, you know. i'm doing all this stuff like you think i can just you know leverage it to put it out at a platform and distribute to people right so that's how the idea of search capital came in so there i basically i'm not doing anything more than what i'm doing for myself so whatever stock i'm buying for myself basically i'm just recommending that and doing the research and all that stuff and whatever reading i do for day to day on my part right whatever i find i interesting or things i like thinking about that i give out as a blog in the section of search so it's basically just it's one thing but now since it is going to a lot of people so that's a different level of engagement that this comes fantastic what are challenges did you face initially by building search capital sir like first you have to give a get a lot of licenses and uh, regulatory stuff in place right yeah the regulatory stuff was relatively easy uh, yeah. because i had everything what was needed like i had a good qualification i got experience right and even when i was there at stallion so the research analyst of stallion was me 
So the report used to go in my name, and my name was there with Sebi. So that past uh, history was there, and like it. both at Money Life and Stalin also, like I was there on the compliance front also. Got it. Like being the CA, like so. At that time, when I was there in Money Life, so they were applying for the PMS license of Money Life. Money Life was uh, that time just an advisor, so uh-huh. the RAI, RAI license. So that entire application, I was there with that. So, got it. Completing the application and all that stuff. So, uh-huh. I had a very good hang of all these regulations, like SEBI RAI regulation. I might have read like five, seven times already before search on. So I had a very good hang of you know. How it has to be done and what is needed. So the regulatory part wasn't that big. But I mean, the bigger challenge was, I think, writing the initial research report because you know when you start, you have to eight ten ideas. So and you know writing eight ten research report is not something that you can do in at that initial initiation report stage. So. So that is where the initial effort went. Otherwise, you know, things are easy. I mean, it, it wasn't that big of a challenge. It was easy. And the platform also, it came out easily because uh, you have this big Celestia company, actually. Uh, so they, like how Blogspot is there. So Wix is a new kind of, you know, they provide this platform, which is very customized to drag and drop what elements you want. In terms of form came out easily on that front of so that way it was good. I mean, there wasn't a lot of challenges except for this, and accepting the fact that you know, in something you uh, you know what you're doing and what you're not doing. So, like no. in terms of on Twitter also, what you're writing about. So earlier uh, used to write anything about anything, but now you can't do it because you know, Sebi, if you, if they have to do your audit, they also check your Twitter profile. Also. Uh-huh. If you have some stock, you can't just keep writing about it and keep talking about it. You know, yeah. and then your trading activity also has to match. So okay. they have this regulation in terms of what you can buy, what you can't buy. Got it. So those things are there. I mean, that is the bigger challenge for anyone who's taking a research analyst license. That you know, your own trading, you know, your own investing takes a bit because if you recommend something, you have to buy it after five days. So. Your recommended entry for the most part, your buy price versus your recommended price, you are buying at least at fifteen twenty percent high uh-huh. for the most part. So, you know, so that's a hit that you have to take on your own for, uh, personal investing. Got it, got it. Coming to your own investment side, sir, what is your own investment side looks like? Like your idea generation process and how do you value a company? So idea generation, you know, the one good thing that happened uh, for me initially was, you know, uh, in 2015, after I started, uh, I came up across uh, William, William Only's book of Canceling. So the good uh-huh. part about that book is, you know, anyone would have read it, is that it provides you a framework of everything, you know, that book focuses on what to do, you know, how you will generate ideas, what you will buy, why you will buy and all those stuff. Uh-huh. So from the very beginning, uh, everything I did had, you know, some framework of, you know, I never, uh, over all this last five, seven years, uh, never did things, you know, on a fluke, you know, mm-hmm. if I, okay, this guy is buying something like this, and it looks interesting, let's buy. So a framework has been there for all. So in terms of, I have a simple framework that, you know, I want to buy stock, That are gonna grow. Unfortunate time is that you know when the stock is making new price. The thought of the stock is making new and that means the market is also interested in the story in terms of you know what is happening in the business. Yeah. So that means you have a tailwind of market itself. Right. The second time is when you know the stock is available at a very absolute as much. The thought over here is that you know. Although you're buying against what the market is showing you, because you know if the stock is trading at 15 times range of multiple, like, it has come down quite a lot. It's probably trading at 52 weeks. Uh-huh. But you know, over time, realizing it, right, and the valuation normalizes. It will one year sitting into the 
that stock which you wanted to set if you buy a stock at me right in terms of what to buy factors on which according like what i have seen over the years is that you know uh-huh. there are couple of factors which determines you know the long term earnings so either the first is obviously you know the business model has to be good so you know the thought process is so what i was saying was that you know the overall framework is such that you know i have to buy companies that are going to grow earnings for next 3 4 5 years yeah. right and buy them at two opportunities the first opportune time is when the stock is making new highs mm-hmm. the thought over here is that you know if the stock is making new highs that means the market is agreeing yeah, is believing in terms of what the business is going to do mm-hmm. right so you have the stale wind of market so which is good the second opportune time is when you know the stock is available at absolute low valuation so like yeah. something like less than 20 times multiple of 15 times got it the thought over here is that you know although you're buying against the market because you know if the stock is at 15 20 times multiple probably at 52 week lows or something yeah right but over time if you're right fundamentally when you know the market agrees over time so when the valuation multiples normalizes from yeah. this very low absolute multiple to normal so you make up that loss higher up when mm-hmm. which you left by waiting for a stock to start moving yeah right, for market for you to wait in so okay. that is broadly when i buy largely has to be on you know for the most part i buy on new highs because you know in the current market you hardly get stocks which are trading at very low multiple on mm. absolute basis everything will get discounted very fast so you know is trading at 40 50 60 times multiple easy so those kind of opportunities are quite rare in terms of fundamentals so uh, i have this so since i'm looking at earning growth so the primary part of it so i have the six factors that i look at uh, which over the years of my investing journey i realized that these are the six factors you know that kind of determines the long term earning growth of stocks so yeah the first is that of you know strong businesses like companies that have strong business model so it is broadly you know the traditional sense the theory what part what it says is about the moats and all that stuff uh-huh. so in theory moats is what gives business a strength right so it could be something like brands and all that stuff but that is the old definition i believe yeah. practically now brands get challenged quite a lot because of you know the free venture the capital don't doesn't act that moat as such now yeah. but what i have realized you know the real moat is companies within the business model is such that you know you have to look at value addition what, what value is this company adding to its customer uh-huh. uh, so i think and this is something i realized you know uh, back when when i was there in my life so initially a lot of companies that i used to analyze was you know typical one of the mill tradition businesses you know and if actually being very normal businesses you know i looked at businesses so businesses you know they are doing a uh, value added work you know because what these guys are doing from in manufacturing for you know it is not something anyone can start and do gosh so that is where i realized you know that there are very a lot of businesses you know where the kind of value added work that they are doing it just puts them into a situation where you know long term they started out looking for businesses you know that are doing some niche work or you know adding value so we take some like a power exchange or any exchange business, right they are providing a lot of value so power exchange is providing a lot of value by you know providing uh, liquidity payment certainty you know Correct. ability to balance your demand supply you know so if you find those companies you know it's a very decent probability that these guys will uh, grow up because uh, like you know costco is a great example right you know the kind of value earning and the same thing is being replicated in dmart also right so since it, it's a normal retail business but you know they have this understanding you know the value that we have to provide is you know discount so you want to make just 4% margin that's it whatever upside that you have you just pass it on so the value that you keep adding keeps on growing so this kind of moat anyone cannot come and you know challenge with capital and all that stuff right 
because that value addition you know doesn't come with capital you either have to give it for free or it won't work right same yeah. as you know this innovative plans manufacturing that I was talking about suvan the biggest problem that people don't realize is you know the orders that you have to do is like 5 kg 10 kg 50 kg right yeah. and so you might have a you know a very big setup but the orders that you get are very small mm. so your capacity will never get filled yeah right? so you have to work with that mindset that you know i have to take hundreds of projects smaller smaller make it make 10 different products every now and then and do it so that mindset is not there for everyone right not yeah. every company can work with that mindset yeah correct right? okay. so th- th- that is where the value addition is. it's not it's not just because the business as such it also comes from mindset right so a lot of retail companies can have would have tried to do dmart a cost right but they can't do because that mindset has to come that you know i have to make only this part then i have to make the 4% and i have to pass on every benefit yeah right? so in theory there is concept of uh, scale economic share right yeah that in the in the in the nature wise and happier book right passing i don't know where is it this yeah. is something that i have realized and then over time i think i read it somewhere also uh-huh. so if you have companies that are doing that then basically you know even if some big guy comes into the picture he can't do, take it away because you have already got a lot of leadership on that part so okay. it's not an absolute leadership but it's a leadership that you know you can't achieve by throwing money money at it okay. right so that is the primary focus but obviously uh, it's difficult to find those kind of stocks those kind of businesses that way right but if you find them I mean, the, those are those are the biggest wealth creators you will see for the long term. Then the second thing that we look for is change or external trend. So a mm-hmm. lot of time, what happens is like management change is a normal thing that a lot of people talk about. But a lot of time, what happens is if you, if you see historically, this is what I've realized. Seeing you know some of the bigger winners, whatever I've uh, done in the market, you know, is seeing what is what are what have been the big winners in the last twenty years. Yeah, will work for them. Mm-hmm. So historically, I've seen you know some of the bigger ones, Lao Pala, Avanti Feeds, Kaveri Seeds. These guys were the you know multi baggers of their time. Yeah. And and all these things, I realized that you know there has been this one external change that happened for all these companies, and uh-huh. that led to one. So for Avanti Feeds, it was you know that new type of shrimps getting allowed to be cultivated. Before that, you know, shrimps industry was growing at just two percent in India. Mm. Once this Vietnamese seeds, white shrimps, whatever they were called, I'm not going to remember. So the industry started growing at twenty percent, right? So if the industry is growing at twenty percent, Avanti could grow at forty percent, thirty percent, whatever, right? Same with Lao Pala, right? The import duty ban came, anti-dumping duty came, and that's when it started growing. Same for Kaveri Seed, BT cotton hybrid was allowed, and then it started growing. Correct. So a lot of times, and now I've like I have seen this and created this pattern, but I have seen that play out practically. Now with PLI, what has happened with Dixon? Right? Mm. It has worked wonderfully. Right? One PLI came in and changed the trajectory of the entire company. Right? Yeah. This company, I think, was like four thousand crores revenue company. Now they want to do what twelve thousand crores in just two years. So it's three x growth in two years. Next year, I think it's seventeen thousand crores or something. <laughs> so it's not because Dixon has a very good business model. Yeah, I mean it's a very normal business model. They 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 are basically you know just assembly. They don't yeah. have any IP. They don't have any skills or nothing. It's like a three percent margin business. But it was external thing. The margins represent, yeah, margins represent what value addition you're doing, right? So if you're just assembling and not doing anything, because you know Samsung comes to them, Samsung says, you know, you buy from this supplier, I'll pay to them, they will start, they will deliver it to your place, you just assemble it, and I'll pick it up. So yeah. you are just assembling it. So since your value addition says that, you only make three four percent. Yeah. Okay. You know, and you know sometimes Suvan makes like forty percent a bit tough because that's the value addition that they are doing. So that things represent what kind of value addition you do. So, but even mm-hmm. though the business is not that value addition, but since you have this external trend, since you, that's why you get so much earnings, right? Okay. The third, third factor that I look at is you know companies that can keep innovating and pivoting, right? Mm-hmm. So every business has a runway, right? So you can't go indefinitely in a certain business. Right? At some point of time, you know, in theory that you talk about that S curve, right? Yeah. You hit, you hit that maturity. But you know, if come they they can keep adding that S curves on top of existing S curves, so the longevity of growth that you get is huge. Yeah. Right? So 
if you take something like astro they started with pipes like they, obviously they were you know, innovators as well with that that from pipes they kept on innovating right so they kept on adding products so because typically what happens is these are the guys who are industry creators right? Right. the guys who innovates and pivots yeah right till astro there was no plastic plastic pipes like cpvc was not there these mm-hmm. are the guys who brought it so you know Correct. You are the innovator. You are already taking advantage of position that you know you are the guy who is going to capture the market, whatever mm. that you are going to create, right? Yeah. And on top of that, you keep adding stuff, right? So the pipe business itself is not going to grow for twenty percent. Right? Yeah. That's not going to grow. But Correct. you know they've added. They've gone into ADSL. They've gone into water tanks. Probably they have into paints as well. So the reason why Astral gets such high multiple because market is now believe that you know Astral is anything brand, right? Ah. Uh. You will like a big thing, right? Mm. Because he has demonstrated that history, you know that I can pivot. Yeah, I can add stuff and I can sell it. Yeah, right. So, I can keep growing up, right? Correct. So if you keep same, so in some cases you can. Something like type Titan, where in years of time you will see like. Whatever. So you know the companies that do this, it's not only the earnings grow, but market also values them very highly. Because market then believes that you know this guy can would be optionality. So optionality is nothing but like a. Like rely. As for last till two thousand seventeen, last ten is doing nothing. But you know, but their stock is now three four x in last three four years, right? So this is Reliance, you know, one of the largest companies. Companies, you know, yeah. that's the best thing you can have, right? Okay. So the optionality is that like, you know, if you have a business who is working on something, right, which is not out there, like. Not visible markets to give value. They want to know some specifics, right? They want to know everything about that business. So once that business starts turning out, you get a sharp rotation because something that was not there suddenly became something, right? Yeah. So there, I mean, there is this very good case study of how AWS came out and how it drove Amazon stock price. Yeah. So there was this time when you know. Uh, Amazon didn't used to disclose. Yeah. 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 So what I was saying was that you know there was this time when you know AWS was not a separate segment for Amazon's financial. Right? Yeah. But the day Amazon started showing it, you know, markets realized you know this is a very profitable business. This is a large size business. This is growing very fast. Yeah. Because next day Amazon stock price was a fourteen percent. Ah. Because you know. Till that time, market had nothing to determine. You know what's the value of this business. Is. But okay. once you have financials over there, I mean, this is something what happens a lot of times. You know, if you uh, see a lot of times, a company which has never done a con call of has presentation, and the first time they uh-huh. came out with a con call presentation, the price know, rose. There's a good re-rating. Yeah, because this is the first time market gets to realize a lot of things that was not known. Okay. So, optionality is the same thing. You know, if you have something that is work in progress, which is not very visible. Once it becomes visible, the market really starts valuing, mm. right? Now also, if you know Amazon, they last I think twenty twenty one end quarter they started disclosing their advertisement revenues. So Amazon has become very big on advertisements. Next day, market the stock price was up ten percent because their advertisement business size is as big as YouTube now. Uh, market didn't know it; they knew that it is big. Yeah, but the numbers came out and people were surprised that it is as big as YouTube, uh, right? So you know, so you if you are able to find those companies, you know, wherein they are working on something, because you can get it. If you say since two thousand eleven, uh, Reliance's annual report, they've always talked about the telecom venture. Uh-huh. Right. Two thousand sixteen annual report, you could see that the launch is impending. They have talked about how many towers they have. So if you can find something like that, you know, and once the market start also gets knows about it, yeah, it's a lot of value. This yeah. is something that plays on D mergers also. So a few X business which was loss making, which you know, was, so the business was not getting its true profit. So okay. the loss making business goes off, 
and you know if the good business remains so it gets the value right because for mar- things for market the things are clear now to see mm. so popularity is one thing then another thing that i look at is leadership and age mm-hmm. right? so big getting bigger is is a real thing you know you know big companies keep getting bigger because the kind of advantage they have is the, it just puts them in a very advantageous position right? yeah so if you have an edge so you know if you see last couple of years cdsl has become the market leader in yeah. the max correct right and the reason is because cdsl had tied with all the discount brokers mm. right nsdl had tied with nothing yeah right? and so the entire industry is going on the back of discount brokers discount brokers CDSL had this edge, yeah. And now CDSL had, even though it is has it has like fifty five sixty percent market share now, but the incumbent market share is like above seventy ninety percent, right? Yeah. So this edge of being a partner with discount brokers, yeah, you know, helped them, right? Yeah. They could so see the trend is like coming of discount brokers, and they hopped on that. Yeah. Trend. So it's not that CDSL doing something better than NSDL. Correct. Right? Yeah. It's a it's a very basic thing, but. due to their partnership this edge is what has allowed them to gain the leadership right mm. once you become leader then you know that gives you additional advantages as a role on mm. right something like apl apollo you know steel fuse business you know 80 90% of the cost is raw material but due to the share size apl apollo can get raw material at 2 to 4% discount mm. so at an 8% ebitda margin business if you can get 3 4% extra that means your profitability is like 50% more than the competitor right and then you can leverage it to you know do all sorts of stuff. branding you know selling low up commodity products at discount and gain uh-huh. share which again adds to it right so if some of the companies who have this edge you know that edge could be a lot of things or you know on an existing leadership that benefits quite a lot right? okay. lastly is you know management so irrespective of what is happening you know even it could be a very bad business but if you have a management you know who is very aggressive and who knows this thing you know the earnings growth can come you know you look look at something like shree cement i mean you show someone shree cement chart mm-hmm. remove the shree cement name from it and tell them which kind of company is it i bet people will say it's an fmcg company chart <laughs> because it's so secular i mean you can't can't believe that it's a cement company right but that has done well in such a cyclical industry in such a commodity industry because the execution of management is they like they focus so much on you know cost savings yeah. on you know what they have to do being in a specific territory they would want to play at not not going after other territories and doing large capexes yeah so that is what allowed shri cement to do so well right so you see something like deepak nitride you know the execution that they were able to do with phenol plant yeah. you know it just amazes people that you know this company had over some 2000 crores of market cap and they came out with a capex of 2100 crores that's i mean for market it was nuts right you know who wants to take that risk? but they were successful because you know the management had that pedigree and look yeah. at where it is i think it's at what 25000 crores market cap wow. right now, if you remember wow 12x right? so you know even though it, the business is not that great you know, mm-hmm. so you know it's still a commodity but you know if you have management who can execute then even a commodity business you can create well correct right so these are the six factors that i broadly look at you know so it's a defined framework obviously you know that helps you keep focus so you know if you have n number of things then you will probably get lost in because there's so much out there so these are few factors that i have seen play out for a lot of past winners right i have seen them play out practically on last couple of years that i have been investing and that is where i focus primarily because you know at six factors you broadly cover a lot of things you know correct it's a broad framework that covers yeah. quite a bit fantastic fantastic like this six framework i think covers the whole kind of great points that a good company should have great. yeah i mean in the end what you want you want earnings growth right so you you don't necessarily have needs to have you know that you know you only want high quality xyz business whatever yeah you know a lot of times certain factors just drives earnings you know you can't help it so yeah. if you are able to figure out some of the factors that you are comfortable with playing yeah. which you can understand then it, it works right yeah got it 
uh, another point i think uh, i think you had tweeted uh, uh, i think one or two months ago so like the process of content aggregation that you do right it's very kind of very difficult like most people see the research aspect research report and at the end product of it but they don't realize that right. you have to go through a lot of lot of articles uh, and research papers and then kind of figure out where to put in then you have to kind of uh, uh kind of present it in a better way so that people can understand right. it right that's a that's actually a tough part because you know yeah. what happens is uh see if you have to write a blog it's a free flowing thing right whatever you know you just keep putting it putting it Correct. it might be like 10 pages long 15 pages long whatever you Correct. can explain a lot of it but you know you can't put do that in a research report. Correct. right in research you have to explain in the shortest possible forms you know that this is what the business is this is what you you should buy it. this is what you're good this is what it's good and you correct. can't write it in an essay form correct right? it has to be more data specific correct. and specific points like to relate so that the reader can relate to it. so what happens is you start writing first draft you write the entire draft right then you have to realize you know this is what i should cut this is what i should keep to make it precise and then that draft you have to then present it to in a better way because mm. this is a free flowing draft right you know Paragraph by paragraph, paragraph, yeah, paragraph, 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 paragraph. But you have to put it. And a lot of times, you know, what happens is while reading, uh, while doing research, you read a lot of things and you get an idea, okay, you might have seen this data point and this is this. Uh-huh. But you have to write a report. You have to explain that thing the fact, you know, that this company has this edge. So you have to get all those data points, right? You know, so that the reader can relate to it. Just because you yeah. are saying it, he, he won't agree to it, right? Okay. So you have to provide all those data points. A lot of things that you know qualitatively, you have to go and find out data points so that you can just prove it. Right. So that takes a lot of effort. I mean, research writing takes the report writing takes at least two three days. Full. Even after you know everything, like you've yeah. done all your work, you know what why why you're buying this, what the thesis and everything. But just to frame it, a lot of times you know, it's all the qualitative points. You get stuck. How to explain it? Right. Yeah. So. There, I, I don't remember the specific phrase for it. It's called some uh, writer's dilemma or something. Bad, uh-huh. Some some lock or something. Uh-huh. Right? Some somewhere I read. Uh-huh. Someone, a good writer, remembered that. You know. So what he said was that if you result in a such such a situation, skip that part, uh-huh. take up another part of the writing which you know how to frame, and then uh-huh. so it works. I mean, it takes some time to do it, and you know, a lot of people think that it's easy. To create content and write reports. Even yeah. when I was writing in the blog, so the frequency was not that good. Like I wasn't writing one every week because writing one itself was used to take a couple of days, right? Mm. Then you have to also maintain a quality. Let's see. What I've always believed in, you know, doing market commentary is very easy, to be honest. You know, you can talk about 10, 15 stocks every now and then. But you know, you have to give something that adds value, which is differentiated, because you know. I, I am not going to write about Titan, right? Everyone knows there's so many research reports. Everyone can find more data about it, yeah. right? So what's value I'm going to add about it, mm. right? So those things matter. I mean, in the end, your content has to be differentiated and has to add value. And if, okay. if it has to do that, I mean, there's a lot of effort that has to go into it. Correct. Fantastic. Uh, so you talked about you meant uh, you uh, uh, kind of level up the value uh, value proposition from diary of a private private investor to search capital. Now, what are your yeah. future plans with search capital? See the bigger game, then you know. So you do it on your own. That's one. Right? Yeah. Then you do it as a research analyst by recommending Correct. stocks. Uh-huh. The bigger game now is actually managing the funds. Right? Fund, yeah. PMS, AIS, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the bigger game. I mean, that's the, normally the bigger game, right? Mm-hmm. What everyone wants to play. Because therein you can get to keep that score of AUM also. Correct. So, you know, you made, you generated 30% seizure on your own account. It's fine. Nobody, nobody gives a shit, to be honest. Uh-huh. Right? You generated 30% CHR on a research or advisory platform. That's good. But if you do it on 100 crores AUM or 200 crores AUM, then you're king. Right? <laughs> Yeah, that that is where people recognize. You know, Warren Buffett hasn't done the best CAGR, but he has done such a huge sum of money and for so long. Yeah, which is why he is Warren Buffett, right? Okay. So that is the bigger game, right? Obviously. So at some point of time, obviously, Surge has to add that part as well. Yeah. But 
that that would take time the way our regulations are structured is very difficult for a new guy to start managing points yeah yeah like it's not us where you can just start the next day yeah so 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 yeah, are you planning to launch something like a small case or or a proper pms proper pms small case is basically our research product on here it basically it adds an execution factor to what you are sharing but the problem that i have faced with uh, small case is you know it's just the execution part right so mm. small case if you are launch something a small case uh, you, what the end customer might get is like 10 15 stock ideas right yeah and they just buy it Mm. So my proposition has always been very clear that you know just knowing the names of stocks won't help. You know, I mean, you, you go to Twitter now if you want stock names, everybody shares five six ideas every day, right? <laughs> But then that won't help you build conviction, right? Correct. You have to because you know I'm not executing for you. You have to buy it and you have to hold it also. Right? Correct. So for that you need to understand why we are buying. It. So research is very important, which is which I always believed in. So with small case you can't do that. Uh-huh. So Small case, I am not gonna do anything. It would be fund management because yeah. small case also what it's research on, you know, it's uh-huh. giving advice. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's same thing. It's an extension of how you wanna run a research. Either you wanna give just names or you wanna give research and updates as well. Fantastic! All the best for your future plans with Search Capital, sir. Yeah. Thanks. And now all my questions are over, but uh, we have some two three questions from the Twitter Q and A, right? Hmm. uh yeah i will start with the asking your questions uh majid khan uh, uh, at the rate hyper global capital he is asking views on ida future and volatility is the social media news affects the stock returns for the long term holdings by ida it's like intellect design right <laughs> yeah you see uh there's this you know I have always felt that you know it's a classic case of tangible versus intangible, right? And this surprises me quite a lot because you know Indian market and Indian investors, you know, we are very well read, so we read a lot of things, you know, for US players on you know wherever we can find good stuff on. And so much has been written about tangibles versus intangibles. Right? The concept is very simple, you know, if you have a manufacturing company, hundred crores revenue, if that guy has to double his revenue. He has to do at least fifty, hundred crores of capex, right? But that capex goes through balance sheet, right? But if that guy has to do that hundred crores of capex through P and L, profit and loss account, you know, by the time that capex comes in, you know, which is when the revenue will start adding, the P and L is gonna look what? I mean, probably it's gonna be loss making, right? Yeah. But yeah. just because they are shifting that capex to balance sheet, you know. The only th- thing you get is direct revenues and profits, right? You don't mm-hmm. get the cost of investing in that. This is the tangible businesses, right? But some of the intangible businesses they don't have capex, right? Yeah. So yeah. like software product business, they don't have capex. Yeah. Right. The capex is their R and D spends and sales and marketing spends. Correct. Right. So if any company has to grow, they have to first invest and then they'll get benefits out of it. So correct. So there's always a lag. The only lag is not in services business, like IT services. When uh-huh. you hire ten people from the next month, that ten people will start generating revenues for you. Mm. So the revenues and cost moves in tandem. Correct. Right? Okay. But the bad part over there is that you don't get operating leverage. One rupee of cost will add say two rupees of revenue, right? So if you want operating leverage, it has to come in a manufacturing or some other kind of business, right? In services business, you don't get operating leverage to a large extent. So same thing with something like intellect design, you know. They are investing in R and D and sales and marketing. Entirety of it is going into P and L. So during the investment phase, obviously the margins are going to go is going to be depressed, right? Or they are going to come down a little bit. So that differentiation is something that I think market needs to understand, right? And it surprises me because you know we are so well read, right? We have everyone would have read Michael Mobison's Tangible Versus Intangible. I can guarantee you, right? It's a good paper. Uh, everyone would have read it, but we have not came to a point to apply practically and the reason i believe is because you know this tangible intangible business came to the us market probably in 2000s right that is when yeah. they bought all this kind of businesses yeah. but in india you hardly have four five such businesses and yeah. those have also come in last couple of years Correct. so you know something like this intellect uh, is there newgen software is there on the it side and now you have tips and saregama on the music 
streaming yeah. yeah that is also intangible business yeah, yeah. to acquire content and that goes to the pnl yeah. then you will probably have something like map my india which is mm. also yeah. intangible but not sure why they don't they don't have any investment into the product so i think over time markets will realize that how to do it right even though everyone knows but practically we are not at that stage this is what my understanding is mm. because otherwise you know there's nothing if you if this if they start capitalizing it then you will get a good pnl right so okay. i think that's the thing that is affecting it otherwise i don't see any reason why these things shouldn't get valid got it got it yeah fantastic fantastic thanks for coming on the podcast sir yeah thank yeah. you for having me i learned a lot of things like the six 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 step framework was like really it covers all the points like all, all you only need those six point in your mind or in the paper yeah. to kind of filter the stocks yeah, yeah it becomes easy then yeah fantastic yeah. thank thanks again sir thank you sir